To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, my name is Nazari and I follow the teachings of the Disciples of Truth. Today, I'm going to be doing a teaching on the so-called Holy Trinity. And we're going to prove today that the Trinity is a false teaching. We're going to open in scripture with Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the highest all power is one. So in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, it doesn't say anything about the Trinity. It says, Hear, O Israel, the highest all power is one. So this is telling you that our Creator is one. Let's see if this change in the New Testament, when we look at Mark chapter 12, verse 29, it says, And the Messiah answered him and said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the highest all power is one. So we see here even the Messiah acknowledging that he has a power over him. So there is no such thing as the Holy Trinity. The whole word Trinity itself appears nowhere in the scriptures. So how can you be a Bible believer and believe in a word that does not come up in the scripture? The doctrine is completely false and we'll continue to prove it. Because one thing we know for sure is that the Almighty himself, he answers prayer. He does not pray, he answers prayer. And we see instances in the scripture where his son, the Messiah, was praying. First, we're going to prove that he answers prayer. Psalms 143 verse 1. It says, Hear my prayer, O power. Give air to my supplications. In thy faithfulness, answer me. And in thy righteousness. Now we're going to show you examples where the Messiah, the Son of the Father, was praying. John chapter 17 verse 1. It says, These words spake the Messiah and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. So right here, it shows you that it's a father and a son relationship. It's completely separate. They're different. John chapter 17, verse 9, it says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Again, we see an instance here where the Messiah is praying. So he's, not, he's clearly not praying to himself. So he has to be praying to someone that is above him. The next point we are going to establish is that he did not raise himself from the grave. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and it reads that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth our Savior and shalt believe in thine heart that the Father had risen him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So clearly it shows you that someone raised the Messiah up from the grave. He did not raise himself. So how could he still turn around and be the father if we clearly see that the father is the one who resurrected him? So the father was never dead. That's not a, a sound doctrine. How can you even say that the creator of heaven and earth and everything died and he was resurrected? That's not biblical. That's not in the scripture. We're going to look at Acts chapter 3 verse 26. It says, Unto you first, O father, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you. So this again shows you clearly that it's a father and a son and that they are separate. They are not one and the same. Acts chapter 4 verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of the Son of Man of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom the Father raised from the dead. So again, it's telling you clearly that the Father is the one that raised the Son. And in addition to him being the Son, the Scripture tells you that he was begotten. So he was not eternal. The Scripture says he was begotten. Begotten means that you were born. You came into existence. We're going to prove that. John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, For the Father so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
For the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Begotten means to have. Let's prove that. Genesis 5 and 4. And the days of Adam after he begot Seth were 800 years. So begotten means to come into existence, to be born. And we're going to show you how he was born in Colossians 1, verse 13 to 15. We're going to look at that now. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into his kingdom of his dear son. Again, we see father and son relationship. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible creator? The firstborn of of every creature so before heaven and earth before moon stars and all that type of stuff the Sun was created he was in existence this is how he is before all things so don't take it out of context and say that he is the actual father when this scripture clearly tells you that he was born now we're going to look at the other side of the argument and see why people say that he is the father for example, we take a look at John chapter 10, verse 30. It says, I and my father are one. So everyone believes that because it says, I and my father are one, that clears it up. He has to be the father, doesn't he? Well, let's find out. John chapter 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, holy father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are one. So that refutes John 10 and 30 for people who are trying to use that to say that when it says that the Father and the Son are one, they're the same. That's not what it's telling you. Because here we just read that we could be one with the Father. So does that mean that we existed from the ancient of days, from the beginning of time? No. The next scripture that people try to use it's John chapter 8, verse 58. It says, The Messiah said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. People try to use this scripture to say that he was the father, or he is the father. But that's not what it's telling you. It's just telling you that before Abraham was, he was already in existence. And I agree to that. Because in Colossians 1 and 15 that we just read, it tells you that before anything was, he was there. But he was the firstborn. Right? So now we're going to go into the Old Testament and we're going to show you how he was already existing. Because a lot of persons don't understand this. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 10. It says, And the Lord delivered unto me two tablets of stone written with the finger of the Most High. So right here, we see two individuals, two separate individuals. I'm going to read it again. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. It says, And the Lord, that's one person, delivered unto me two tablets of stone written with the finger of the Most High. But it's showing you it's two separate entities. Now we're going to look at another scripture that people try to use. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, people have to understand that the terms God and Lord are just titles. Anyone that's over you is your Lord. Anyone that's over you is a God. And we're going to prove that through Scripture. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So now you're telling me, that Moses is God. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So we have to understand that when the scripture says God or Lord, it's talking about being a higher power over another individual. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5, And it says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. This is what the scripture is telling you. So when you see a scripture that says God or Lord, you have to really take care and see what it's talking about because the angels are referred to as lords in scripture. We just read that Moses was referred to as a God. And don't even try and come and say that, oh, one is capital, one is common because in the original language, there's no capital and common letters. 
that's completely that's completely false that's just that's just fishing to try and make something make sense that doesn't make sense and does that make sense no it doesn't okay next scripture we're going to look at is John chapter 10 verse 34 and it says the Messiah answered them is it not written in your law I said ye are gods so again now he's referring to Israel and he's saying that look ye are gods why is Israel considered a God because they are above all the other nations it's right here in the scripture Psalms chapter 82 verse 6 it says I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the highest so this is the evidence as to whether or not we should believe in this so-called Holy Trinity and the answer is clearly no because it's not biblical as I said earlier the word Trinity appears nowhere in the scriptures so how can you be a Bible believer and believe in a word that's not in the Bible it's false and it's confusion there are a lot more scriptures that we can go over to the point to show you that the Trinity is false because throughout scripture cover to cover it's showing you that there is only one creator it's not three in one that doctrine is nowhere in the Bible it's past time that we stop believing in non-biblical stuff we can read now so there we have it we know that the word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible so it has to be false We've examined several scriptures to the point that show you that the Father and the Son are completely separate. And if you still can't see it, then you don't want to see it. Because I'd have to ask you again, who was he praying to? The Father does not pray. He answers prayer. He always told, he said, look, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father who sent me. So the Father was in heaven. The evidence is there. Let's end this teaching with this scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fare the Most High and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of man.